Agricultural, uh, Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, and we will start with a listed question. Uh, I have to advise you that question nine has been withdrawn. I call Mr Harold McKay. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number one, please. Officials from my department first learned of this incident in the early afternoon of Saturday the 8th of October 2016 and on-call officers from DARA's Northern Ireland Environment Agency and Inland Fisheries immediately travelled to the scene. By late afternoon, the source of the spill had been traced and samples taken with a view to enforcement action. Inquiries at the source site also quickly determined the precise nature of the chemical involved in this incident and thus the detailed ecological and toxicological information on the potential hazards it poses. Officials from my department promptly notified and have continued to work closely with a range of other agencies to ensure that every possible risk to the environment or to the public has been considered and addressed. So far as the potential ecological harm posed by the spill is concerned, there are three broad lines of inquiry and of mitigation. Firstly, the absolute necessity of protecting public health. Secondly, an assessment of the pollutants' effects on fish and fauna in the river. Finally, an assessment of any potential damage to commercial fish shellfish beds where the river enters Dundrum Bay. So far as the risk to public health is concerned, the data on this chemical confirms that although it is toxic to fish, it does not pose a significant risk to human health. Nevertheless, my department has worked closely with relevant agencies, including the Food Standards Agency and Newry Morn and Down District Council, to ensure that all possible risks are considered and addressed. All of the evidence to date confirms that there has been no risk or to, to or impact on public health. With regards to the effects on fish and fauna in the Innsborough River, um, the chemical to involved is toxic to fish and my inland fisheries officials have confirmed that in excess of 1,600 fish were killed. Some of these were adult salmon and sea trout and this will undoubtedly have an effect on the river for many months to come. The inland fisheries are already working with others to consider how the river could be restocked. NIEA is also carrying out a biological survey of insects in the area. Thank you. Can I remind uh, the Minister of the Two-Minute Rule? Uh, Mr McKay. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer this far. Does the Minister agree with me that until people within public bodies, such as NI Water, begin to be held to account for these incidents of pollution, the current penalties will continue to prove to be ineffective? Um, I thank the, the member for his question, and I, I do agree with the member with regards to those who are responsible for um, um, pollution incidents such as this, be they in public bodies, businesses or, or private individuals. Um, there is a, a process within which my department has to operate, but we, we also need to look at um, education. Um, uh, and advocacy alongside our enforcement um, rules um, and while NI Water obviously um, hasn't, there's, a, there's an ongoing investigation and, and while they have admitted um, that they are responsible, there is still an ongoing piece of work to be had with them. I call Alex Easton. Can I thank the Minister for her answer so far? I understand that Northern Ireland Water have accepted responsibility for the fish kill at Lansborough. Um, have Northern Ireland Water uh, been associated with many fish kills previously? Minister. Uh, thank the, the member for his question. And since um, January um, the 1st, 2012, there have been 44 major or moderate fish kills in Northern Ireland, where the cause was due to a polluting discharge. Um, Northern Ireland water has been determined by any IEA as the source in respect of two of those 44 fish kills were the further two incidents, including um, last week's fish kill in the Carrigs River, um, remaining at various stages of um, enforcement processes. In 2010, a moderate fish kill associated with Tandra Gee wastewater treatment works resulted in a £5,000 fine. And in 2014, a moderate fish kill associated with a pumping station in Balna Hinch received a warning letter from NIEA with £1,600 worth £1,600 in fishery restoration costs, which were retrieved from Northern Ireland Water. Thank you. I call Trevor Lunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, thank the Minister for her answer so far. Um, she'll, she'll be aware, as she commented herself, that this is only the latest in the long string. We've had the Fawn, the Ravarnet, the Comber River, the Lagan, the, uh, I forget some of the others. It's, uh, 
six mile water and the three mile water just in recent times. And can we keep it to South Down, please? <laughs> um, but, but the Minister agree with me that, in fact, the, the, the sanctions and the punishments are actually available through the existing law to, to deal with this kind of pollution incident much more seriously. But in fact, that the courts very rarely impose a fine which to the rest of us would seem commensurate with the actual offence. The fines are, are piffling. Minister. I thank, thank the member for his question. And, and obviously, the whole issue around pollution is something which I do take seriously, and, and it does cause me concern. Um, it's happened in, in rivers in my own constituency, and, and, I, and, I, and I do understand the, the impact that it does have on, on the habitat and also those who use the rivers. Um, and very often, as you say, it doesn't seem that the, the fine is commensurate with the, the issue um, and with obviously the crime which has been committed. Um, I'm happy to have further conversations in relation to this uh, and to pursue this um, um, and, uh, and I'm open to, to conversations with members as well. I call Pam Cameron. Please. Minister. The department introduced the Clean Neighbourhoods and Environment Act Northern Ireland 2011 to allow councils to issue fixed penalty notices of up to £80. The number of fixed penalties issued by councils for litter offences increased to 4,443 in 2014-15, up from 3,268 in 2011-12, where the case is dealt with by the courts, a fine of up to £2,500 can be imposed. And I will continue to keep the situation under review, taking appropriate action where necessary. Um, the department also introduced the carrier bag levy in April 2013, which has reduced the number of bags dispensed in Northern Ireland by tens of millions every year, and thereby reduced the number of bags littering our public spaces. The levy is the most extensive of any of the carrier bag charging arrangements on these islands, and has generated millions of pounds for local environment projects, including anti-litter projects. And a review of the charge, as members are aware, is currently underway. Education is a vital component in the fight against litter, and to that end, DARA works closely with councils and NGOs to develop and support educational and promotional campaigns aimed at achieving behavioural change. An example, my department um, provides significant financial support, nearly £945,000 in the period 2014-15 um, and 16-17 to keep Northern Ireland Beautiful, who run a number of programmes, including Eco Schools and Live Here, Love Here. As of January 2015, Northern Ireland was the first country to have every single school signed up to the Eco Schools programme. Additionally, NIEA currently runs a fly tipping partnership programme with councils to clean up fly, waste, fly tipped wastes. My department is using a combined approach of legislation, education, awareness and enforcement to tackle litter in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Pam Cameron. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer. Um, I, I personally am very aware of the, uh, how successful this uh, challenge fund has been in, in South Antrim in particular, especially around the eco-schools, and uh, in, in particular Bally Craigie in Antrim and Fairview in Ballyclare, and the tremendous work they're doing and the, uh, how that then goes home to the parents as well, that education, I very much welcome that. Have you any plans to reopen this fund? Yes, and I thank the member for her question. I'm delighted to announce today that an initial £400,000 sourced from the carrier bag levy will be available for the challenge fund in the current financial year for not-for-profit organisations delivering projects which aim to improve the local environment and boost civic pride. This funding of £400,000 will potentially further support later in the year will in, um, enable local communities um, schools and voluntary organisations to undertake small-scale projects to improve the environment and deliver environmental education. Community groups, for example, can use the funding to enhance their local area through tidying a local beach or neglected beauty spot or creating and enhancing areas where the public can enjoy the local environment. I'm pleased to be able to deliver further resources for the fund and ensure that this good work in our schools and communities can continue. This competitive fund will award monies to organisations delivering projects on civic pride, access and recreation, education and awareness and environmental management. To date, more than £4.6 million has been awarded from the Challenge Fund, enabling almost 600 environmental projects to be carried out 
and I'm pleased to be able to deliver further resource to ensure that this good work continues. Thank you. I call Richie McPhillips. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers so far. And she's touched on the subject of my question a number of times. But would you agree, Minister, that the plastic bag task tax has greatly contributed to the reduction of litter in both urban and rural areas to date? Um, I thank the, the member for his question. Indeed, I do. And, and obviously, the, the Challenge Fund has, has, has made a huge difference, particularly around um, including um, schools and community groups to get involved. And, and that's why I'm particularly keen that with this new element of the fund that um, we include the theme of civic pride, because I think that's incredibly important. And I know that we all, as elected representatives, who engage with our local communities and village groups will understand that the pride that they have in, in, in their local area, and this is really just to help encourage them to do that. So this is an incentive, as, as, most, as well as anything else, um, but it has made a, a tremendous difference. Thank you. I call Mr. Philip Smith. Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister, you mentioned in, in your previous answer uh, fixed penalties uh, for littering. Uh, as two councils seem to account for 67% of all fixed penalties, and with the bill for street cleaning topping 40 million for the first time, what plans do you have to encourage other councils to use their fixed penalty powers more? Minister. I uh, thank the member for his question. Indeed, there is a disparity there, and there's, there's, a, there's an education program, I think, which needs to be carried out not only within our communities but also alongside our, our, our local councils. And um, I am aware, obviously, with the changes in, in the local councils and also changes in personnel, that there are probably a, a variety of policies which are still being looked at and um, addressed with each, within each council. So um, I'm obviously following on from today will content to have conversations with councils and particularly with my, my, my officials leading on that to ensure that, um, that, that this, it's encouraged. Um, but I think what we do need to be sure of is what we need to try to do is really have an education programme where we can avoid littering in the first instance. Thank you. I call Declan McAleer. Um, could I ask the Minister, has she given any consideration to working towards a zero waste policy? I uh, thank, thank the member for his question and, and obviously um, a zero waste society doesn't necessarily mean that we produce no waste um, and it is about trying to reduce the amount of waste that does go to landfill. Um, there is currently a, a policy of promoting reuse and recycling which will then in itself then hopefully lead to um, towards um, zero waste. Um, the department did publish um, the Road to Zero Waste pol publication in um, September 14, and it's something which we're obviously working to, to achieve. Um, there, there are a number of projects around each of the council areas around circular economy and encouraging business to get involved <coughs> in that. And also aware, with, even within my own constituency of, of a, a large business, who have, we would say they have zero waste, and they've, in, they've invested a considerable amount of money within their plant to ensure that everything is recycled or reused. So it's about trying to encourage that and to change the mindset of people with regards to their attitude to waste. Thank you. Mr. Raymond McCann. Three. My department is responsible for the conservation and protection of salmon and inland fish stocks on Loch Ney and for the issuing of licenses for commercial fishing of eels and scale fish. It also provides financial assistance to the Loch Ney Fishermen's Cooperative Society towards the eel restocking program, which is a conservation measure as outlined in the EU eel regulations. The department is satisfied that the cooperative is complying with the conditions of funding contained in the letter of offer. This funding is not related to the issue of commercial permits. The fishing rights for Loch Ney are owned by the cooperative and it is a matter for that organisation to manage its own interests, including the issue of permits to allow fishermen to fish for eels and scale fish. The department has no role to play in this process. The rules regarding the issue of permits to fishermen are agreed by the cooperative and any applications for permits are considered against these criteria. While under no obligation, the cooperative has provided my, my officials with clarification and supporting documentation in respect of the processes for administering applications for permits and indeed it has been the subject of two judicial reviews in the past. The locks fish stocks are a finite resource and the cooperative must control fishing intensity to ensure the long-term sustainability of the fishery. 
The serious decline of eel stocks across Europe has intensified the need to manage stocks effectively. DERA inland fisheries officials are currently finalising a fishery management plan for Loch Ney, which aims to ensure the sustainable management of fish stocks on the loch and to maximise the socio-economic benefit of the fishery for communities around the loch shore, the local economy and the ecology of the loch. And one of the recommendations in the draft plan, which was agreed by stakeholders, was the introduction of a scale fish uh, permit system, and this has now been achieved. Thank you, Mr McCann. Uh, I uh, thank the Minister for that. Uh, the Minister, I know, is aware of uh, the very strong feelings which exist among uh, some fishermen are in, uh, in, uh, around uh, Loch Ney, particularly on the part of those fishermen who, although members of the Loch Ney Fishermen's Cooperative Society, find that they haven't got and cannot uh, uh, get from Waiting the, uh, for the cooperative. Question, Mr. McCann. Sorry. Yeah, so my question is this, sort of, given that background and given that the department has, at the very least because of the public money involved, an overall supervisory uh, role, would she agree to meet a number of the uh, fishermen who are aggrieved uh, and discuss the matter with them further? Minister. Um, I thank the, the member for his question. and He may be aware that I've, in, the, in the last mandate I, I chaired the um, Committee for Culture, Arts and Leisure for a number of years uh, and during that time I, I met with the fishermen on a number of occasions and, that, and obviously then went to the um, to tomb to meet with the cooperative as well. Um, I'm more than happy to meet with the fishermen um, to discuss their issue, um, although I, I have met with them before I'm happy to do that again with this particular hat on. Thank you. I call Robin Swan. Mr Deputy Speaker and the Minister is well aware of this issue. Minister, can you give us an update of what actions are actually being taken to tackle salmon poaching on illegal fishing on Loch Ney and uh, illegal fishing in full? Because I'm also aware her predecessor promised a full audit of all the fish stock in Loch Ney and has that been completed yet? Minister. Uh, thank the, the member for his question, and um, I, I'm happy to have the, those conversations in relation to the, the audit. I wasn't aware whether it had been completed or not, and don't have that information, but happy to provide it. Mr. David Ford. I thank the Minister for her answer, but she indicated officials had discussed the matter of the allocation of licences with representatives of the cooperative. Can we take it, therefore, that she hasn't yet had discussions with those members of the cooperative who are currently not uh, allocated licences and are currently in dispute with the co-op? Minister. Um, for, I thank the, the member for his question. My, my conversations that I've had in the past were when I had a, was wearing a, a different hat. Um, my, my officials um, speak regularly with the cooperative, and I know that over the last number of years I've spoken regularly with um, members of, of the cooperative who do not have permits. Um, I was in attendance at those meetings um, as the chair of the CAL committee. Um, I haven't met them in my current role, but I'm happy to do so, and my officials will accompany me at the, those meetings. Mr. William Humphreys. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, what is the current position regarding commercial eel fishing on Loch Erne? Um, thank, thank the member for his question. In December 2008, the UK submitted um, 15 eel management plans, including the transboundary plan for the iron system, for individual assessment to the European Commission covering the river basin districts as defined under the Water Framework Directive in England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Uh, these plans were approved by the Commission and the Management Committee for Fisheries on the 4th of March 2010 and are being implemented in accordance with the regulation. The eel fishery, as the member will know, was closed in 2010 as a condition of the EU approval of the Northwest Eel Management Plan and some 17 Loch Iron fishermen who apply each year for licences and permits issued by the former decal to fish for brown eels could no longer do so. Following the closure, local eel fishermen were entitled to tender for participation in the trap and truck conservation fishery which catches silver eels and moves them downstream of the two dams. This provided potential to an alternative source of income for the fishermen after the closure of the commercial eel fishery. A range of conditions and actions in the eel management plan are being kept under regular review and progress on these is reported to the EU. And to date, there has not been any variation or amendment to the conditions applied to the eel management plan. Next question, Mr. Paul Jervin. Question number four, Minister. 
In 2015, my department provisionally approved applications from young farmers to the regional reserve and the young farmers payment who had become head of holding and who were not in a position to provide all of the required evidence to support their applications. My department has sought the necessary information in recent weeks in order to prevent any delay to 2016 payments. I'm pleased that many young farmers have provided the information required. My officials have assessed the information speedily and have issued advance payments to those who have satisfied the criteria. Where there are outstanding issues with an individual's young farmer's payment and where possible, my department has made an advance payment on the other elements of their claim. I would strongly encourage all farmers yet to provide the required evidence to do so as soon as possible to ensure the full payment is issued to them in December. Thank you, Mr. Carvin. Thank you, and thank the Minister for her answer. How many young farmers, or what percentage of young farmers, have received an advance payment? Thank the member for his question. Of the 1,780 successful applications in 2015, 593 have been paid an advanced young farmers payment in October. Of those applicants with outstanding issues around the young farmers element of their payment, an advance payment on BPS and greening has been issued to 548 applicants. Therefore, 1,141 young farmers applicants from 2015 have received an advance payment for one or more elements of their claim in 2016. Of the remaining applications from 2015, the majority have yet to provide the evidence necessary to make their young farmers payment in 2016, and a small number with evidence supplied are yet to be assessed. Of the 746 new applications for the young farmers payment and or young farmers regional reserve in 2016, 458 have been paid an advance payment. The remaining applications are being assessed or have been rejected. Thank you, Mr. Oliver McMullen. Uh, Minister, um, the, scheme, the Young Farmer Scheme has turned out to be very, very successful. Have you any new measures or plans to uh, put in place that we can encourage maybe more young, young farmers to come forward because they are going to be the future of the industry? Minister. Uh, thank the, the member for his, his question. And obviously, there's an opportunity um, each year for new entrants to apply if, if they meet the criteria. Um, it has to be said that I want to ensure that our agri food sector is, um, is growing and can be sustainable in order to encourage young farmers to, and young people actually to get involved in the agricultural sector. Um, I want to see a future for them in the industry. Um, you'll, you'll obviously be aware that the Young Farmers Clubs of Ulster and the Ulster Farmers Union have been doing a considerable amount of work in relation to succession planning and I look forward to having a meeting with them in the near future to see how we can help um, to assist them with that project. Um, and you'll also be aware that, um, that there are and there will be additional weighting given to young farmers in, with regards to the Farm Business Improvement Scheme. The, the capital element of that, just to encourage um, those younger people to get involved in farming and to invest in their business going forward. But it's critical on all of us really to ensure that we do support the farming industry and for, for those young people to see that there is a future in it and for to encourage them to become involved. Thank you, Mr. Patrick McLone. Uh, I'll ask you for you. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank, thank the you. Minister for her reply as well. Uh, could the Minister outline for us any details that you can give about uh, discussions or otherwise with Westminster around a replacement for the basic payment scheme? Minister. Thank the, the member for his question, and the, the member will be aware that my department has been, has been working um, alongside um, the um, has been working alongside Westminster in, with regards to um, looking at what the future may look like with regards to support for farmers going forward. Um, he'll be aware that I met with Andrea Leadsom last week and I also hosted George Eustace to Northern Ireland. Um, and during that visit, 
um, apart from actually um, allowing George Eustace to, to meet with industry representatives and stakeholders, it also gave him an opportunity to look at the vision that he has moving forward for any potential support. And really what it is, it's, a, it's, I suppose it's about looking at not what we currently have, but what we could possibly have, um, and looking at various <coughs> models, and, and not, partic not specifically picking something off the shelf and applying it to Northern Ireland or to, to, the, to Great Britain, to the United Kingdom, but actually something which is very much bespoke to the needs that we have here. Um, so there are ongoing conversations between um, myself and my, and my department and, and Westminster around what a, a support system may look like. Thank you, Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you. Uh, would the Minister undertake to look at the departmental guidance on the Young Farmer Scheme, particularly in regard to the bizarre and seemingly unnecessary stipulations in respect of partnership agreements, where uh, for some unknown reason there is a stipulation that though one is head of holding, you have to consent if a partner wishes to leave the partnership, which is unheard of, I suggest, in respect of partnership law, and yet is become an obstacle to some young farmers who otherwise qualify, qualifying for the payment. Minister. Um, thank the, the member for his question, and, and I'm aware that that's, this is a particular issue for uh, Mr. Alistair and one of his constituents, and, and I'm happy for to meet with him and officials in order to discuss this um, particular issue, um, uh, and um, we'll make arrangements with Mr. Alistair to do so. Thank you, Mr. Steve Aiken. Uh, thank, you, Mayor, thank you, Minister, for our remarks so far. An uh, issue where there is currently a great deal of anger amongst many young farmers about their applications and what they say is an unwarranted checks on paperwork. Can the Minister explain why our department waited so long and so close to the issuing of this year's payments before contacting young farmers and asking them for their appropriate documentation? Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank the member for his question, and I am aware of, the, of that as, as an issue. Um, it has been raised with me on a number of occasions, um, and, and very recently I attended the Fermanagh group meeting um, uh, of the Ulster Farmers Union, and a number of young farmers raised in the body of the meeting and also spoke to me privately around, about it. And I have raised that with officials um, with regards to why it, it, they were requ was requested of them so late. Um, in the year. Um, my understanding is that, that they wrote to relevant applicants in September as they were unable perhaps earlier to have the evidence which was required in order to meet um, their, um, the, the deadline for um, receipt of the advance payments. But I understand that a number of them actually have been able to get their information in the time and have been able to qualify for advance payments in October. Thank you. Next question, Mr. Paul Frew. Five. Minister. With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I will answer questions 5, 6 and 13 together. The agri-food sector in Northern Ireland is much more important to the local economy than is the, the case in the rest of the United Kingdom. The percentage of total employees employed is 5.5% in Northern Ireland compared with 2.4% in the United Kingdom as a whole. In 2014, the Northern Ireland food and drink sector generated sales of £4.5 billion and employed well over 20,000 people. Around 28% of Northern Ireland food and drink sector sales are exported, compared with 10% for the United Kingdom as a whole. Therefore, future trade arrangements are going to be important. Over the past weeks and months, I've met with a number of ministers to discuss the important issues that, that need to be resolved. Last week, I met with Andrea Leadsom, and I hosted a visit by George Eustace to Northern Ireland and, and impressed on them the unique position of our agri-food sector. We had meetings with a range of agri-food, environmental and fishery stakeholders and departmental officials. Uh, and yesterday, um, First Minister and Deputy First Minister attended the first Joint Ministerial Council on exiting the European Union, where they emphasised the strategic importance of the local agri-food sector and sought assurances that we would be kept closely and directly involved in the agricultural, environmental and fisheries policy and trade agendas as they unfold. Uh, Mr. Farouk, uh, quick supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, despite the, uh, the doom and gloom merchants and the Ramoners Minister that would be placed within this House, it was really encouraging to see the DEFRA Minister here last week at your invitation. 
You've already alluded to this, but uh, it seemed to be George Hughes was, was thinking outside the box. Can you give us any more specific details uh, about support post leaving the EU? Ask the minister to, to be brief in her reply. I thank the, the member for his question, and, and as, I've, as I previously stated to um, the, the member er, uh, earlier, um, George Eustace did share some of his early thoughts with regards to uh, what any support um, package may look like. Um, he has, he's he wanting to be visionary with regards to this. He's looking for fresh ideas, and he isn't closing the door to anyone with regards to ideas coming forward as to what that may look like. Um, we do need to look at. We don't necessarily have to look necessarily to what we have before, but there is an opportunity for something different. Um, he has mentioned the Canadian model, the Australian model and various other examples that could be looked at. Um, but as I've said, not necessarily sort of picking one of those and applying them, but something which would be bespoke for the United Kingdom. Uh, and obviously, as a, as a region, we would be looking for some type of flexibilities within the framework that would be offered. Thank you. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Mark Durkin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank the Minister for her answers thus far. If I could ask the Minister to give to the House her assessment of the threat against the red squirrel population of Northern Ireland. Minister. Um, you weren't I, for that one, I'll tell you. <laughs> I, very, I, very much, I very much appreciate the, the, um, the question from the member. And, and I am aware that whenever um, he was the Minister for the Environment, that he did have a particular interest in, in the red squirrels, along with hedgehogs, I believe, as well. So just with, with regards to the, um, the red squirrel population, I'm, I don't have exact figures as to how many there are in Northern Ireland. But I am aware that there are around 120,000 red squirrels right across the United Kingdom, 75% of those in <coughs> Scotland. Um, and there are sort of hot spots of um, red squirrel populations in Northern Ireland, particularly around the Ring of Gullion. Um, we have a number of conservation groups specifically set up to look at the red squirrel. And I know that there is, there is one in, in the minister's uh, sorry, the former minister's constituency, um, and he, he may not have time actually to, to join that conservation group and to give them a hand in their monitoring um, of the red squirrel. Um, I do want to pay tribute to, to the volunteers who work very hard in order to try to, to monitor and to, to retain the population in Northern Ireland. Um, and anyone who follows, as I do, the Red Squirrels United um, Northern Ireland um, Twitter um, uh, they will um, be aware that there is an issue, particularly around um, pox, um, which is the virus which comes from the, the grey squirrel, and um, it is an issue actually in the Mourns area. Mr. Jorgen. I thank the Minister for that very comprehensive answer. Uh, if I could ask the, the Minister maybe to expand on that by, by telling us what her department is doing to protect not only our red squirrels, but other species at risk here. Yes. Um, I thank the member for his question. And obviously, I'm very conscious of the State of Nature report, which was published very recently, and the number of, of species around Northern Ireland who, who are um, under threat, particularly the red squirrel and, and also the hedgehogs as well. Um, the uh, groups such as Ulster Wildlife Trust work very closely on, on these matters, and, and, and they are leading the campaign with regards to the red squirrel. Um, they have received funding from um, Heritage Lottery, um, and I know that they have a four-year programme with regards to that particular project, um, which will be about monitoring and surveying um, the, red, the red squirrel in particular. Um, you will also be aware that the Grassroots Challenge um, project was launched just a couple of weeks ago in the Long Gallery, and I was, I was privileged to be at that, um, where they're working alongside um, Young Farmers Clubs of Ulster, the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme, and also special schools. And that's really just to encourage um, young people over the next five years to become involved in the environment and also to, to look out for our, our, our particularly our endangered species. So there's a good piece of work going on with regards to those organisations, and, and it's important that my department works alongside to support where they can. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barry McElduff. Can I ask the Minister if uh, she and her department officials will work closely with Minister Michelle O'Neill and her departmental officials to discuss the implications of the Bengoa report essentially for rural communities, not least isolated rural communities. Minister. 
thank the member for his, his um, question and obviously that's a, a fundamental piece of work which was um, announced today and of course I'll, I'll work alongside all executive colleagues in relation to the implementation of that. Mr. Michael Dove. Can I ask the Minister to have at the forefront of her mind the weighting that needs to be given to rural needs and rural proofing in decision making and secondly to remind other executive colleagues when appropriate and necessary that the definition of social deprivation includes distance from essential health services. Minister. Uh, thank the, the member for his question uh, and as the member will be aware that I have responsibility obviously for the implementation of the Rural Needs Act and um, it falls on me to be the voice of um, rural needs around the executive table and I certainly will be uh, I will be a constant reminder to my colleagues although I, I would hope, like to think that that will come naturally to them as time goes on and that they will be cognizant of rural needs as most of us in this chamber do represent um, a rural constituency so it's coming on, on, on all of them to be cognizant of that. Uh, I'm very much aware of um, social isolation um, and the needs to particularly around health service and access to that and obviously in my previous role I was very supportive of community transport um, and the, the work which they do, um, particularly the volunteers who, who help um, those who, are, who do find themselves in an isolated situation to be able to access um, their hospital appointments and doctor's appointments, so very much um, I will be involved with that. Thank you, Mr. Fran McCann. For me, I'll ask the last caller. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister uh, confirm that she is aware of the details of the current mentoring programme that rural support have in place? Minister. Um, uh, thank the, the member for his his um, question, and that's probably not unconnected to the question. Um, previously um, by, by his own party colleague, um, but I am very much um, aware of the value that, that rural support gives to rural communities. Um, they are a listening and signposting um, service for farmers and rural families. Um, the mentoring programme, which is on farm mentoring programme, has been very successful, um, particularly during um, difficulties, particularly around financial um, problems, um, and it's, it's important that we encourage people to actually use that service, so I'm very, very supportive of the work that they're doing. Mr McCann. Uh, thank you, Mr Minister, for a question thus far, but can she confirm that she has mm -hmm. looked at securing funding to assist the rural support to increase the capacity to give support, particularly in late for the refer referendum result and welfare reform? Uh, thank, the, thank the member for his question and he'll be aware that um, rural support obviously um, receives funding for a, a, a number of different agencies but my department um, supports them with around £91,000 on an annual basis and this is through our TRIPSI um, programme. Um, I know that my officials have ongoing conversations with rural support with regards to their funding. Um, as I've said that we're supportive of the work that they do, particularly working with um, with farming families and, and, and rural families um, and we would be encouraging them to continue with that work so we will we'll be working alongside them in order to ensure delivery of that. You, I call Claire Bailey. Thank you Deputy Speaker. Uh, given the seemingly systemic failings in environmental protections in Northern Ireland, has the Minister had any discussions with the Minister for Infrastructure on the obvious need for an independent environmental protection agency? Minister. Uh, thank the, the member for, his, for her question um, and she'll be aware from um, previous responses that I've made with regards to an independent um, environment agency that it is not my, is not my intention um, to, to bring forward an independent group. But what I do want to do is um, to see the um, appointment, a reappointment now of independent members to the NIE board. Um, they were previously um, taken off that board by a, a former environment minister. Um, and I want to see that um, reversed um, because I do value the, um, the expertise and, and um, insight that an in, in, independent external um, in, um, panel members would bring to that. Um, but I have to say that I am responsible for protecting our environment. Uh, I take this very seriously. It's part of, it's part of my remit and I have no int intention of abdicating that responsibility. Thank you. Ms Bailey. In that case, then, can the Minister give any solid confirmation that all investigations into the Annesborough event 
must include an examination of past incidences and equipment failures, including whether secondary pollution prevention measures by NI Water were or should have been in place. Minister. Thank the, the member for a question, and I, and I will give that commitment. And I have sought uh, a meeting with the, the chief executive of Northern Ireland Water in order to discuss not only the, the Ainsbury incident but, but other incidents. Um, uh, so, and as I said, I do take this very seriously, uh, and, and I will continue um, to have dialogue with, it, with, with anyone who I feel um, could benefit from um, a discussion with m myself or the department. Thank you. I call Emma Little Pengelly. Speaker, uh, I welcome the recent announcement from the Minister uh, that Northern Ireland would be the first region uh, in the United Kingdom to make advance uh, payments under the 2016 Basic Payments Scheme. Can the Minister outline uh, how many farmers have received advance payments at this stage? Minister. I thank the, the member for her question and I'm pleased to be able to confirm that 90.72% of eligible farmers have received an advance payment, <coughs> resulting in a total of 158,475,453 pounds, um, reaching 21,111 farmers um, much earlier um, this year than they would have. And I'm delighted with this outcome, which will exceed the challenging target of 80 per cent, which I'd set my, um, my officials. But I do want to say that I do pay tribute to the staff in Orchard House who have worked extremely hard in order to be able to achieve this. Um, we are the first region in the United Kingdom to make advance payments, and I'm delighted that we have surpassed our target. Thank you. Uh, Mrs Pengelly. I thank the Minister for that answer. Has the Minister or our Department carried out any comparative analysis uh, on the demand here or on the potential benefit to Northern Ireland compared to the rest of the United Kingdom? Minister. Thank the, the member for her question. Uh, Northern Ireland is the first region, as I've said, of the United Kingdom to issue advance cap payments. Um, this is a significant achievement and one which the industry has been asking for. Um, in Scotland, for example, payments for 2015 are still being made. Furthermore, the Scottish Government does not appear to be in a position to make any payments in 2016 and has had to introduce a, introduce a nationally funded loan scheme where farmers can apply to receive a loan of 80 per cent of their cap payment. So this is, a, this is an important um, move for my department and I'm absolutely delighted um, with the results that we've made this year. Thank you. I call uh, Mr Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, the recent area committee, uh, Tony O'Neill, Chair of the Agri-Food Strategy Board, actually said everybody prepares for the Public Account Committee before they do the project. They do two projects at once, one to implement it and the other to at the same time preparing their defence. And the PAC has become our greatest weakness. Would the Minister agree with Mr O'Neill's comments that her department are actually preparing two projects simultaneously? Minister. Um, thank the um, member for his question, I'm, and I'm very much aware of the comments which Ms. Roney made to the committee with regards to, to PAC. I, the, the member will be aware that we all work within a framework of good governance and financial accountability for public money. Um, there are rules which are in place, and um, we, we need to abide by those. Um, I suppose, regardless of the rules that we have, I suppose we will, we will be critical of officials, and we will say that they are risk averse. Um, but whether that's a fair criticism or not is. Um, is debatable. Um, I don't agree with the comments that he made with regards to that. Mr Swan. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I'm glad to hear that. At the same committee meeting, Mr O'Neill also said there's too many farmers in Northern Ireland, and I would hope that the Minister wouldn't agree with those comments either. And taking those two in consideration, does the Minister still have faith in Tony O'Neill as Chair of the Agri-Food Strategy Board? Minister. I am very much aware, as I have said, of Mr O'Neill's comments with regards to the number of farmers as well, and Mr O'Neill has been challenged in relation to that. Um, he has been challenged um, um, by the Ulster Farmers Union, and I have also been in, um, in his presence since he made those comments and, and have spoken to him about it. I am um, very much focused on championing the position of all farmers in Northern Ireland and not being selective as to who I support. Um, I want to see the, the sector grow, I want to see it productive, and I want to see it sustainable. Um, with regards to having confidence in Mr O'Neill, that is a very loaded question. Um, 
but, Ms. Uh, but the member will also be aware that the, um, the Agri-Food Strategy Board, as, an org as, a, as a group, um, their tenure will come to an end in, in February um, next year. Thank you. Uh, Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Minister, for your questions, or for your answers so far. Can, Minister, can you provide an update on the number of appeals still ongoing for the 215 payments? Ask the Minister to be brief in her reply. Thank the, the member for her question. Um, I, I, actually, I don't have that information at hand, but happy to, to get that to the member. Thank you. Time is up.